I want. Very good morning to all of you. Uh, greetings from the beautiful Sri Lanka. I'm Professor Indika Karunathilaka, President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Vice President of the Asia Pacific Academic Consortium of Public Health. I'm connecting with all of you live from this historic Vijayaram House, the headquarters of Sri Lanka Medical Association. Once again, very good morning to over 1,000 participants for joining with us from 40 countries. And good evening to the friends who are connecting from US and Canada. On behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Asia Pacific Academic Consortium for Public Health, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you for the first APAC SLMA International Virtual Conference on COVID-19 pandemic, breaking the transmission chain through community empowerment. This topic becomes even more pertinent at a time when COVID-19 is cast in a shadow over the globe with over 3 million cases and with over 200,000 deaths. Today, all of us are connected during this historic international virtual conference to discuss how we can face this challenge together. And joining with me today in this historic auditorium at Vijayarab House, we have an elite panel of experts from my right hand side, I have Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama, who is the president of the Ceylon College of Physicians, and very importantly, the chief senior physician from the Infectious Disease Hospital in Sri Lanka, who is in the clinical front line. On my left hand side, we have Lieutenant General Shavendra Silva, the chief of defense staff and the command of Sri Lanka Army, and again, very importantly, the head. National Operations Center for Prevention of COVID-19 Outbreak. And then we have Dr. Anil Jasinghe on my left-hand side end, the Director General of Health Services, Sri Lanka. So here we have the leaders of the battle against frontline in Sri Lanka. And again, in our audience, in the auditorium in Sri Lanka, we have another elite panel of experts who are in the forefront of battle, representing all the specialties in medicine, as well as other disciplines. Also the tri forces, the police and law enforcement. So here in Sri Lanka, we are connecting with you, all the stakeholders and all the top leaders related to the COVID-19. And my co-moderator is Professor Vayun Lo, who is the president of APAC. She has been in public health leadership position for over three decades and currently the president of Asia Pacific Academic Council of Public Health and also the deputy executive director in the Asia Europe Institute, University of Malaya. And her interest areas include behavioral sciences, behavioral change, which is very important at this moment, health promotion, HIV AIDS, and aging and men's health. Over to you, Prof. Fayun, for your welcome address. Right, thank you so much, Professor Indika. Uh, my greetings to His Excellency, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, President of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, uh, Lieutenant General Savindra Silva, Head of the National Operations Center for Prevention of COVID-19, Chief of Defense Staff and Commander of the Sri Lankan Army, the Honorable Pavitra Vandanarachi, Minister of Healthcare, Sri Lanka, Dr. Anil Jan Singh, Director General of Health, Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka. Dr. Ananda Vikirama, Chief Consultant Physician at the National Infectious Disease Hospital, Sri Lanka. Professor Indika Karunatila, President of the Sri Lankan Medical Association. Distinguished panelists from Australia, China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, and also our in-studio um, expert panel. Fellow listeners in this webinar, thank you so much for coming to join us uh, in this international webinar. Ibo one, Selamat pagi, very good morning and very good afternoon or good day to all of you here. On behalf of APAC and SLMA, Sri Lanka Medical Association, I take this great pleasure in welcoming all of you 
to the international webinar on COVID-19, breaking the transmission change through community empowerment, a pandemic issue that has become a leading and elevated concern to the world. This webinar is co-organized together with the Sri Lankan Medical Association, and I would like to thank SLMA for their great assistance and for hosting this very important webinar. We are very delighted indeed to have you all here to participate, exchange knowledge, as well as share experiences with each other. This webinar acts as a platform where all healthcare professionals convey their thoughts as to how they mobilize the community and respond to this COVID-19 pandemic. It is worthy to note a global meeting with distinguished participants from all over the world today. This is a good indication of the value of webinar as it shows that citizens' health is a shared concern for all of us. APAC, an independent multinational non-government organization, take this opportunity to play a significant role in this pandemic. The discussion at this webinar will undoubtedly contribute towards debate on breaking the transmission change of COVID-19 through community mobilization and empowerment. We hope that you will use this web banner as a platform to network while reflecting on the challenges and how to overcome this pandemic. I wish you all an enjoyable and productive discussion. Thank you all. Over to you, Indika. Thank you, Professor Vayun, for those words of wisdom coming from the leadership position in the Asia Pacific Public Health. We'll be now straight away moving into the academic program and the country presentations. We'll be starting with the host country, Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka has so far done exceptionally well in controlling the COVID situation, COVID-19 situation. And the Sri Lankan response has been very unique due to many reasons. One of the main priorities in the Sri Lankan response was identification of contacts and contact tracing and high-risk individuals and quarantining and treating them. So with that approach, Sri Lanka has been very successful. This was achieved through a combined effort from the Tri-Forces, the Sri Lanka Army, Navy, Air Force, the police, law enforcement, the Ministry of Health, and the public administrative system. This is something, that, something unique that we can learn about. There's no one better to talk about this combined effort other than Lieutenant General Shavendra Silva, head National Operations Center for Prevention of COVID-19. So let's listen to the experience that is shared by General Shavendra Silva. At the onset, I'm glad to deliver a brief description of the Sri Lankan approach in combating the COVID-19 outbreak at the head of the National Operations Center for Prevention of COVID-19. Chief of Defense Staff and the Commander of the Army. I would cover firstly the base of the approach, secondly the contribution by the military forces, and finally how the Sri Lankan approach became uh, unique. With the spread of the COVID-19 globally, His Excellency the President appointed a task force on 26 January 2020 for preventing the spread of deadly COVID. 19 in Sri Lanka. With the recommendation of the committee, closure of schools followed by movement of restrictions, curfews, isolation of affected areas are being enforced as and when required. The declaration of the COVID-19 as a pandemic by the World Health Organization, WHO, followed by the report of the first case in Sri Lanka and subsequent growth of cases prompted the necessity of a national strategy to underpin the coordination, collaboration, and recalibration of responsibilities of different agencies for which the National Operation Center for the Prevention of COVID-19 was established by His Excellency the President, entrusting me to spearhead its effective functioning. As we recognize the COVID-19 outbreak is beyond a health crisis, the response strategized the effort into three pillars, containment of affected cases, 
prevention of further spreading and minimizing the losses of life. Firstly, the containment is spearheaded by triforces with frequent patronage of health expertise. Secondly, the prevention of further spreading is the responsibility of all citizens and it heavily count on the best health practices, personal responsibility and law enforcing agencies, etc. Lastly, minimizing the losses of lives, moreover, the relied upon patients' management by our great health authorities. In this backdrop, let me explain the unique role played by the armed forces. As the survival of the nation at any difficult times, Sri Lankan armed forces coordinated the battle against this dangerous disease and were instrumental in containment and prevention of the disease being spread. The objectives were operationalized through the comprehensive quarantine process. Apparently, triforces are functioning more than 50 quarantine centers in island world. Contract tracing of defected personnel in the most important factor for containment and further spreading. The intelligent services of the armed forces and the police with the patronage of health authorities are being tasked to conduct contract tracing into first, second, and third tiers of the confirmed, suspected, and exposed cases. Therefore, the quarantine processes and the conduct of PCR testing were followed up as and when required. However, the spatial distribution of the population in some areas is too congested in Sri Lanka so that the home-based quarantine is not possible. To negotiate this, we introduced the root ball system, perhaps the first time in the world, in that we pulled out the personnel of close contacts as whole group and transferred them to quarantine centers. In addition, the areas seemingly contaminated are designated and kept as isolated zones prescribing the inward and outward movements. Now I would bring upon how our approach became unique. The approach is based on the trinity of synergy, efficiency, and public compliance. If I harm about the achievement of synergy, the most response option prepared by the expertise from different fields are discussed, argued, and agreed upon at the National Operations Center Forum before operationalizing. The efficiency is ensured through calibration and prioritizing of role, responsibilities, understanding whom to support and whom to be supported in achieving sub objectives, tasks and actions to regulate the overall strategy. While elegant in its outlook, the strategy belied a jumble depending upon this public compliance. National and private media are extensively used for indoctrinating the necessity of compliance with instruction issued by all types of authorities. Therefore, I hope this trinity of synergy, efficiency, and public compliance serves as a unique approach for the response strategy. Finally, I would like to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association for organizing this virtual conference, giving an opportunity to be connected to an intellectual forum of this nature so that we can mutualize our experiences. I am fervently looking forward to share and receiving valuable comments, waves, and of course, the information that would be useful to fight against COVID-19 in future. Thank you. Thank you, Commander, sir.
for explaining and elaborating on the Triforce's contribution towards the nation's battle against COVID-19. Uh, can I ask you uh, to further explain in detail how you have collaborated with the, with the government structure and the Ministry of Health uh, in this uh, uh, identification of risk individuals? You have uh, experienced in uh, mentioned briefly, but if you can elaborate on how exactly it, was, it has happened. Yeah, it's uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, the overall goal of uh, uh, the government response strategy actually was to prevent further transmission of COVID-19 and also to prevent its spreading uh, within the country. So actually what uh, we did was that uh, His Excellency the President appointed me as the head of the COVID-19. All the professionals of uh, different fields, especially uh, from the health sector under the Director General of Health Services. In fact, the Honorable Minister herself, she was there. And uh, we uh, actually, what I did was uh, to get this uh, all together uh, to a mechanism and to uh, fix this to an engine. Uh, all parts were collected and it was uh, made an engine there. To uh, uh, The engine was the strategy uh, which went uh, ahead to uh, in response of COVID-19 in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Now, uh, Sri Lanka is considered as an upper middle country with its own advantages and disadvantages. Sri Lankan public health system is very strong. Similarly, the Sri Lankan tri forces have a lot of experience at the operation level. What were the unique challenges you faced during this response? Actually, I believe that this is the first time that uh, the military get involved in such a thing and uh, of course uh, the most unique thing was the contract tracing that we got involved and uh, to tell you we are a nation that we defeated a ruthless terrorism from the soil of this nation and uh, for that for anyone we should know what is our requirement uh, any field is the same thing why we are existing so even uh, in military, we do the same thing. Why the army is there? For what reason? So here the case is what we wanted to in COVID-19 was uh, how this is going to affect our society. How? The, it has come to Sri Lanka at one stage. Then who is there? Who is doing this? And how can we prevent? So what we were doing is we extensively used the Sri Lankan uh, intelligence services. And uh, they are the people along with the PHIs, then the, we have a very solid uh, system which will be described by the, the Director of General Health Services. Uh, the, the, how the ground level, the Sri Lankan medical services are operating. So we got uh, the use of them uh, in connection uh, to collaborate with our intelligence services. And the most uh, unique thing was the contract tracing. That was a challenge that we had. And also we never knew about what is this quarantine centers. We never had this. His Excellency President, when told me to put up something, uh, our, our aim was how best we look after our own people. It's not others. But we started off looking after the 31 uh, foreigners initially with uh, 16 nations. They also came to us. So what I believe is that we wanted to give the best of the best facilities, but to ensure that they will not spread within the quarantine center. That was a massive challenge. I know that even in our country, some people um, uh, argued or viewed that how can military do this? We did not have experience. It was a, like a on-the-job training that what we did. But we put up with his uh, all. We have a great health services, as I mentioned at the opening remarks. So got the advice from them and we did all what they wanted. We executed their ideas there and we managed to prevent at the very first stage, the first stage of uh, when we brought Sri Lankans from abroad and other people who came from abroad, more than 3,600 we quarantined in 51 quarantine centers. But the uniqueness was not a single spread from A to B uh, within a quarantine center. Those who got uh, 33 cases, they all were who came with the COVID-19 who admitted uh, straight. So that was a challenge that we had. And they are not even working with all other agencies. They are really true professionals. Uh, and they are 
they are thinking you know that it's not like that but our country is a unique country we believe unity our unity was the strength to fight against covid 19 and so sri lankan military always believes the motto nothing impossible so this nothing impossible with unity strength managed to do this and these are certain challenges that we had thank you commander there's another question that's coming from our participants uh, they are asking how many were quarantined in sri lanka what was the number yes now this is a, a bit of a question now we had two processes. One thing is we said in our in my uh, uh, earlier when I spoke, uh, we had containment, prevent spreading, then to look after the who got confirmed from this thing. Now to, for the containment, what we do, did was initially we brought uh, from foreign from foreign countries who came. That was the first stage. After that was over. Now we started off with the contract tracing. Whoever a person who got initially what we did was if a person got confirmed then uh, we found who are the contacts all contacts we found first second third tier and they were uh, self quarantine and all, all house quarantine they put in a house quarantine self quarantine then as i mentioned th that crowd is different then the third crowd was this quarantine centers initially we started a broad group later we got this contract tracing they were also put quarantine that group has gone, uh, we already have released more than 4,600. Another, as of today, we have 3,900 in quarantine centers. That's come to almost about uh, 10,000. Then, plus, those who were not sent to quarantine center initially, who was uh, quarantined in houses, but uh, this has two categories. Some people came from abroad. The government policy was whoever who came from abroad should be quarantined in a house. That crowd went up to 55,000. So uh, with the contract tracing, there was another about three to 4,000. So approximately about 58,000, we were uh, trying to isolate. You can't say quarantine. We isolated them in their houses, but the, that is the number. Yeah. Thank you, Commander. Uh, what are the good practices that you can suggest to the regions in the country? Because this was a unique approach. Yeah, of course. Now, before finishing that, I think one might uh, think that we had 60,000 cases. No. Yeah. Actually, you know the numbers of cases, but those uh, those associated that we were trying to yes. hold them on isolation. But yes, the good things are that I believe that the main thing, uh, of course, the best practices of self-discipline of individuals, without which you can't do anything. Uh, you can bring the best practices of the world, but it's not going to work unless every individual of the society have a motto. That the motto is nothing but that I will not get infected by somebody and I will not infect another person. That is the principle of every human being as a citizen. That is the greatest, greatest duty that you can do to a citizen. So I think that everybody should try to practice through media. Media is a massive role they can play in this game, COVID-19. So they must educate each and everything. We know how the Director General Health Services and their doctors every morning till night they do. So you have to educate the population exactly because still we do not know how this is spreading. There are things still it's learning. So we have to educate them. Uh, that is one mo most important thing. But I think the other thing is contact tracing. Without tracing, you have to one might argue that why military? Of course, in a country like a unique country like our island nation, Sri Lanka, they have good public health system. We can do it, but still, without which I think for us in our government, the selected military, but I think that was a contact tracing is one of the most unique things that I can suggest for them. And also maybe uh, after that, there should be a, some method of quarantining anyone, whether self, house or a center. These are unique things. I can keep on explaining, but I know limited time, these, these three things is the most unique, I believe. Thank you, Commander. I think you mentioned the importance of the education communication as well. The whole idea of this conference is also community empowerment. The, the community need to be empowered. The health education communication is very important and where the media plays a big role. And then getting back to public care, the Sri Lanka's public care system is very unique. Uh, we have Dr. Anil Jasing, the Director of Health Services of Sri Lanka. 
uh, Dr. Jasinga, would you like to explain very briefly about Sri Lanka's response, public health response, and how the country has managed so far? Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Indika. Thank you, organizers. Uh, now, uh, I think that is the unique feature in Sri Lanka and maybe few other countries in the world. Uh, now, also, uh, one thing is public health approach, and the other thing is uh, the overall approach into the question. Now, you see sometimes uh, most of the countries in the East, uh, you know, based on uh, controlling the disease. If you take uh, the Western countries, you know, uh, they are the, the main thing was, you know, detection and treatment you know, where, where it is uh, uh, concerned. And uh, when it comes to control, uh, all these countries, if you take Singapore, uh, you know, China, uh, uh, all these countries in the East, I think, uh, try to do the same thing, that is control. Uh, when it comes to Sri Lanka, uh, based on our strong public health system, which evolves, from, I mean, so many decades and, uh, you know, centuries, uh, uh, we were able to uh, harness the strength uh, that, that is inert within us. And uh, now uh, we have been also uh, had success of uh, controlling so many diseases and uh, 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 you know, controlling and uh, uh, eliminating so, so many diseases, several diseases. So based on that success, uh, our, the public health uh, teams uh, have the confidence in combating this kind of a disease. So uh, our first uh, objective was uh, to prevent uh, the infection coming into Sri Lanka. So we were basically suc successful for some time, uh, but unfortunately, the, the virus came into this country. And then uh, the next uh, objective was uh, to mitigate and control the infection so that uh, there won't be a spillover. Uh, I, I believe with certain you know, setbacks here and there, uh, that is what we are still doing and we have been still successful and uh, we have had at least uh, uh, at least eight uh, recognized uh, clusters uh, and uh, we have been able to uh, uh, sort of you know uh, finish off those clusters and uh, there, there were two more uh, very bad clusters uh, especially in uh, urban areas and uh, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, the, 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 the clusters linked to sometimes, you know, drug addicts, uh, etc. Uh, but even those clusters, uh, we have been able to uh, 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 achieve success of, uh, you know, maybe 90-95%. And uh, uh, some of the clusters we have officially closed and they, uh, uh, they, they just uh, they have the uh, normal life going on in those areas. Uh, so, uh, therefore, uh, uh, we have the uh, strength of uh, the application of uh, uh, public health and also uh, we have the, the Quarantine and Disease Prevention Act which was, uh, which was enacted uh, uh, in 1897 over 100 years ago, and uh, just to see, uh, even nowadays you could use uh, this ordinance. Uh, there may be certain limitations, but it is amazing that over 100 years, uh, this has been enacted in a way that all these uh, terms, you know, the, the, uh, they, may not use, they may have not used the same terminology, but this lockdown and everything is there. So, so, so that means, uh, we have the legal, uh, uh, you know, cover and legal strength. And more than the legal strength, we have the strength of uh, 
the long standing public health system in this country and 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 those uh, energies when synergized with the strength of uh, sri lankan army intelligence services police and of course other sectors even uh, tapol services we have uh, uh, used for this uh, 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 in this battle uh, at uh, various uh, levels at at various points so therefore uh, i believe uh, that sri lanka uh, the fact that we have not deviated we have not uh, you know deviated from uh, public health and we have been uh, uh, keeping our public health strength because some what what we see is with the development uh, many countries uh, sort of get rid of uh, public health uh, uh, you know uh, arms uh, and then they move into uh, the the curative arm and then sometimes we see the public health is uh, uh, you know uh, sort of uh, uh, engulfed within the 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 curative arm so the fact that we have both these uh, arms uh, working together is a great uh, strength and when it comes to uh, uh, the the treatment capacities of course uh, we have no issues whatsoever and uh, we have been uh, incrementally strengthening uh, strengthening our treatment capacities uh, we don't want to uh, you know say uh, how many you know icu beds how many uh, the, the hospitals uh, that are available but i i assure by now uh, we are ready for uh, any number of uh, cases but once again when 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 you uh, go to public calm the the public uh, the our uh, our objective is not to uh, have patients and treat them but to minimize the number of patients so we have been uh, able to minimize the number of uh, patients uh, even the, the the present day clusters uh we believe uh, through our strong public health system uh, we will uh, soon be able to uh, uh, the curtail uh, or the control the numbers thank you yeah. uh, dr jasinga there is an interesting question coming from the participants uh, i think from indonesia and several other countries they are asking how the sri lanka government manage vulnerable populations such as homeless people or maybe drug addicts or refugees returning refugees uh, what's the government approach in managing them yeah actually this is a complex uh, issue complex situation because we have uh, a population of various socio economic levels uh, the, as you said maybe drug addicts maybe some others uh, sometimes we call lumpens uh, so actually our approach was different uh, when it comes to different uh, the, the groups it's not discrimination Uh, but you know one has to uh, identify detect uh, the, the 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 problems of uh, various uh, segments of so society so that this is where the army uh, uh, was very uh, supportive and uh, uh, and and we could uh, work with army uh, now for example if you uh, have a house uh, well designed house the quarantine is possible Uh, at home but uh, we have areas where the 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 shanties you know the the very poor socio economic conditions uh, and we have one experience very, very ba one bad experience even under curfew uh, there was one uh, shanty area and where there are other shanty uh, uh, you know uh, areas close by and uh, uh, they uh, the even during curfew they had been uh, you know uh, they have been visiting uh, each other uh, you know because that's a sort of a enclosed area uh, so but on the other hand there are different uh, uh, you know shanty uh, outfits uh, so now we got uh, cases from one uh, uh, outfit uh, and then to see The, the 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 some of the other close by shanties also got infected uh, now actually going by the curfew it should not have been so uh, but 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 uh, the the on the ground uh, you know they could uh, move around uh, and this has happened uh, 
so therefore uh, that kind of uh, socio economic groups uh, the 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 as commander said the root bowling uh, was the successful uh, story and also with regard to beggars and you know uh, the the street people uh, they have also been uh, taken to uh, certain uh, certain uh, residential uh, facilities and taken care of uh, them and and one thing i must say uh, what with with notwithstanding the socio economic level uh, i think uh, they have been treated well and uh, uh, they they are given clothes they are given uh, uh, meals and they are uh, they, they, they are their are, uh, requirements are uh, well looked after so therefore uh, the, this is how uh, these uh, uh, special segments of uh, uh, society uh, was you know uh, uh, handled uh, with regard to covid covid 19 thank you thank you dr jasinga and now we'll move into another very special person Dr. Anand Vijay Vikram, who is in the clinical front, and thank you for spending your valuable time here with us, sharing your experience with everyone in the region. Uh, can you explain us about the clinical situation and how many patients at the moment, how many in the ICU? And also there are some questions coming up, like what are the best management options? What's the role of plasma paresis? Or maybe the indigenous medical practices or vitamin D? Like different questions are coming from all over the region. Dr. Anand Vijay Vikram. Uh, thank you, Indika, and uh, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, important virtual conference. Uh, in Sri Lanka, as uh, was explained, we have a unique situation with the support from the uh, and the com uh, combining work of the Ministry of Health and the Armed Forces and the Police, with the support of other uh, administrative structure, uh, we have been able to. Uh, control the spread of the illness uh, in a reasonable to a reasonable extent so therefore uh, we have basically the, the uh, going at a flattened curve uh, with that uh, we have uh, the government at present the uh, the mini health ministry policies to admit all the positive uh, cases whether they are irrespective of their symptomatology at present we can do that because up to now we have uh, close to 700 patients in the country. That is about uh, three per 100,000 incidents. Like uh, we have done uh, more than 20,000 uh, tests, the PCR testing, and uh, the test number of tests are being increased with the increasing number of cases. So this is uh, widely done across the country. And uh, so whoever who is detected as having a positive test is admitted. At, at present, we have identified uh, five hospitals. These uh, uh, positive cases are being admitted to these hospitals and uh, then uh, the uh, for two reasons one thing is to monitor to see whether they are developing symptoms and to detect if they are getting any complications early secondly uh, to isolate them from spreading the disease because of the limited numbers we can continue we are continuing to do this however if we get more numbers we will have to revise this strategy uh, and also we have identified uh, hospitals uh, also there's a plan uh, the, the hospitals to admit symptomatic patients and then uh, intensive care beds to admit uh, those who need critical care uh, care uh, so the, there's a plan uh, out of the the 700 uh, patients uh, or patients who or cases who got uh, positive or found to be positive about uh, two-thirds were asymptomatic uh, so we have a large number of asymptomatic cohort, maybe because of a uh, higher number of testing we do in relation to the population numbers and maybe because of the, uh, the uh, quarantine uh, facilities and contact tracing done with the help of, as explained, with the help of uh, Sri Lankan army and other forces and the police. Uh, so out of the symptomatic patients, we had only uh, 16 severe cases out of these uh, seven patients died uh, and others uh, uh, survived out of the seven the two patients were died uh, within uh, at the time of one patient died at the time of admission and another one a uh, couple of hours later 
and uh, but others uh, given icu care but in spite of uh, intensive care uh, another another five died uh, as uh, now uh, when this started we went through the available evidence and uh, then uh, with the limited available evidence uh, the the experts uh, the, on this field in the country decided to give uh, hydroxychloroquine to uh, patients. So at present, uh, the positive patients, people are getting hydroxychloroquine. I know the evidence are very limited and uh, some uh, evidence available says there's no definitive effect of this compared to other drugs, but still we continue to give that because we started with limited evidence and we, we are continuing to give in that. In fact, we are in the process of analyzing the response of the patients, uh, the physical symptoms, and as well as the, the viral clearance of these patients who are given uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, in severe cases, we have tried uh, convalescent plasma in uh, three instances, uh, and we are in the process of uh, collecting convalescent plasma, checking antibodies, and collecting convalescent plasma for future use in if it needs. Uh, other than that, we haven't given any other specific treatment. Uh, other, otherwise, it's a symptomatic treatment and few who had secondary infections had uh, antibiot appropriate antibiotics. Thank you very much, Dr. Ananda. I think uh, with the interest of time, we'll be moving to the other present. There are many interesting questions coming up, but we'll be taking them once the, if the time permits. And uh, now we have the privilege of listening to a world-renowned expert in virology. Uh, from Hong Kong, Professor Malik Piris will be joining with us. Uh, he's connected here. Professor Malik Piris, I don't think we need any introduction to this audience, one of the world-renowned top experts in virology for many decades and who has done a lot of work related to novel viruses. Professor Malik Piris, over to you for your presentation. Uh, I belong to all my colleagues in Sri Lanka and uh, good morning and good evening to, uh, to colleagues across the world. Uh, I'd just like to thank the organizing committee for <laughs> inviting me to join in this uh, um, webinar. And also congratulations to Sri Lanka for the strong efforts it has taken to combat uh, COVID-19. If I can have the first slide, I will um, try to explain the experience of Hong Kong. So Hong Kong, as you know, is a special administrative region of China. Um, and uh, it has a number of unique challenges. So for example, it's a very busy international airport uh, with about 200 people thousand people coming and going every day. But even more than that, uh, we have about 300,000 people crossing the, the, the border between Hong Kong and mainland China. Um, um, and in addition to all of that, this outbreak started in early end of December, early January. And towards the end of January, we have the Chinese New Year holiday where huge numbers of people move up and down across China. And uh, usually, there is about 4.4 million people moving from Hong Kong uh, across the, uh, the, the border to, to mainland China during that time. And finally, uh, Wuhan, where the outbreak started, is one of the travel hubs in the high-speed rail link uh, across China. And of course, Hong Kong is part of that. So, so we really had some major uh, challenges to, to face. So you can see the epidemic curve there from we had the earliest cases uh, around the 16th or 17th of January. Uh, and these that early wave that you see from middle of January to end of February were mainly uh, uh, people coming in from mainland China and of course some local transmission. So you can see the dark bars are the imported cases and the lighter bars are local transmission. Uh, so that um, was essentially contained by, uh, by by reducing travel. So, for example, tour groups were suspended, flights were, were reduced, uh, uh, and then to, to stop local transmission, uh, public facilities were closed, um, hospital visitors were, were stopped so that on, only patients can go into hospital, and there was progressive reduction of travel uh, in those subsequent uh, periods. And then, of course, there were a number of other categories of interventions. So you can see the, the case-based interventions, which is uh, aggressive testing, isolation, contact tracing, and quarantine. 
uh, of, of contacts. Uh, the, the PCR testing for diagnostics was rapidly ramped up. Initially, of course, focused on identifying you know, uh, suspected patients, but then, uh, uh, and of course their contacts, but then extended to accident and emergency units and also to, to private practitioners. So now there is quite extensive testing going on. And more recently, we also now test all incoming travelers at the airport. So uh, nobody is allowed to leave the airport until they are tested and found to be negative. So this is quite an aggressive uh, implementation of testing, uh, uh, isolation, and of course, contact tracing. The other community-based interventions were school closures implemented very early, uh, uh, banning of large gatherings such as sports events and conferences, uh, encouraging people to work from home, and then uh, non-essential workers, including government, uh, civil servants, etc., were uh, asked to work from home wherever possible. Uh, subsequently, banning gathering of more than four people uh, at any one place. Uh, restaurant restrictions, uh, restaurants were not closed, but uh, uh, there are minimal uh, distances uh, between uh, tables, etc. And uh, things like bars, etc. were closed because there were some outbreaks that uh, were, were, took place in, in that type of crowded environment. So um, I think, so it's important to, 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 to note that Hong Kong has never been in a lockdown in the way that it is talked about, uh, for example, in New York or, or in many, many other countries, or has not had a curfew as such. But what we have had is very aggressive uh, social distancing measures. And what you can see, so in, in the second big uh, peak that you see, is actually attributed not to cases coming uh, introduced from mainland China, but these were uh, Hong Kong students, many of whom were studying in Europe, mainly in the United Kingdom because of traditional links with the UK. So with the increase of the outbreaks in Europe, uh, these universities and student, um, schools were being closed and, and these people came back in large numbers. So that second peak that you see uh, right through March and uh, early part of April is really returning tra travelers coming from Europe and of course some local transmission taking place. But with this combination of um, social distancing, uh, aggressive diagnosis, contact tracing and isolation, essentially we have been able to bring the outbreak under control. So for the last two or three weeks, the only cases that have been detected are people uh, infected outside uh, who have been diagnosed here in Hong Kong after return and for the last five days we have not had a single case. So um, of course I think the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the general who spoke uh, I think mentioned the importance of public participation and, and indeed uh, this has been extremely important. So, so the, the perception and the implementation of uh, measures have been quite high in the general public. And the attitudes towards this, for example, avoiding crowded places, um, uh, hand hygiene, etc., have uh, improved very, very dramatically. So of course, uh, then uh, the question is, what is next? Uh, so at the moment, of course, the, the case numbers are very low, but uh, we cannot maintain this extent of social distancing uh, because uh, even though we are not in a lockdown, it is still hurting the economy quite dramatically. So uh, from next week, we, Hong Kong will begin to gradually relax some of these measures. Um, but I think it's, I think we all fully understand that this is a disease, this is a problem that is not going to go away. So um, it is not a sprint, it is a marathon. The only way this outbreak will come under complete control is when the population has sufficient immunity, which means about 50% or more of the population has immunity to this virus. So the only way you will get immunity is either through natural infection, which will be terrible, or vaccination. And we know that a vaccine is still well over one year away. So this is a long-term 
uh, effort that we have to take to, to keep this outbreak under control. So, so it is no back to normal uh, that we can think about, but we have to try to relax. So the, the kind of idea is uh, if you imagine that this is a car at the top of a slope, we have to get to the bottom of the hill. Uh, and uh, the only control we have is the brakes and we have to get to the bottom of the hill. So we all we can do is to keep applying the brakes and releasing the brakes in a in a graded process so that the car doesn't go out of control. So this is a very challenging uh, uh, issue that that we have, and that's essentially the approach that we need to take. So the the way forward, uh, certainly as we see it, is that um, we will Hong Kong will do some relaxation of these measures in a very gradual process, but will maintain very high surveillance, very high testing. And uh, as if we notice the uh, outbreak is again going re-emerging, then the uh, social distancing measures will be uh, re, uh, reintroduced. Um, so the other measures that, sorry, I, I should point out that one of the key issues, and again, I think the point was made by the earlier speakers about the importance of contact tracing. And the reason why contact tracing is so important in this outbreak is we now know, and this is um, studies done by my colleagues at the School of Public Health, that about 45% of infections uh, are acquired before the index case develops symptoms, right? So if a lot of transmission is taking place before the person even knows that they are ill, Diagnosing and isolation is important, but is not sufficient. So you really have to get ahead of that curve. And that is where the very aggressive contact tracing becomes uh, so important. Uh, so I think uh, essentially this is the, the way ahead as far as we can see it. We will gradually relax some of the social distancing measures, but maintain very high levels of surveillance, testing contract tracing, so that we essentially um, break hard or break less uh, and do this in a very uh, informed way uh, so that we can get through, and this is a long time more, uh, to a time when there will be hopefully a vaccine. But one has to emphasize that this is still probably more than a year away. Uh, so I thank you all and I'll be happy to take any questions. Over. Thank you, Professor Malik Pires. I think all of us will agree that every word carries wisdom. And uh, thank you for summarizing and conceptualizing the way forward in such a beautiful way. Uh, Professor Malik Pires, uh, if I am to ask a question on your areas of expertise, now there are a lot of questions related to the testing. What is your recommendation related to testing policies for the countries in the region? Should it be RT-PCR or is there all for antibody testing? And to what extent should it be mass level or should it be based on epidemiological data like the first level contacts? Any advice as for all of us? Yes. Yeah, so um, as, as regards to antibody, I think, uh, you know, certainly we have also developed antibody tests and we have done uh, some studies on, on uh, antibody tests in patients and also in, in the general population. So I think what is clear is that in the first few days of, uh, of onset, uh, after onset of illness, uh, antibody tests are largely negative. They do become positive over time, uh, but until about three or four weeks after onset, 100% of patients are not antibody positive. Uh, it can be quite variable. So antibody testing for diagnosis of patients, uh, I think is not really, uh, certainly not the primary uh, approach that one needs to take. So we really have to rely on PCR testing uh, for that. Um, so I think, you know, the PCR testing of course needs to be, um, depends on the capacity that uh, each um, country has it clearly needs to be decentralized so that uh, you don't waste so much time in, in transport of specimens uh, over long, long distances so that the turnaround time can be minimized. Obviously, the test itself has a minimum period of turnaround time of, of uh, six or seven hours. But if you add the transport of specimens, then it becomes uh, quite uh, quite a problematic. And uh, uh, but I think, you know, um, at the moment, I, I believe 
uh, Sri Lanka's testing capacity is adequate, but I think keeping in mind uh, that this is a long-term uh, effort and there will be periods where the outbreak increases and uh, you try to bring it back under control, I think this is probably the time to try to enhance your capacity further and decentralize your capacity further as well. And this, of course, applies to, 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 to every, every country in different ways, obviously. Uh, the primary aim is, of course, to test suspected patients and, um, the, and, and uh, contacts. And then when you release people from quarantine camps, for example. Um, but I think, uh, um, sorry, I, I was about to say something else, but I have lost my, my train of thought there. So I shall, I shall stop there and, and see if you have any further questions. Over. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Malik Piris. Uh, and we hope that we can utilize your expertise, expertise and experience through uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, SLME, and to Sri Lanka and the countries in the region. Now we'll be moving into Malaysia. Professor Vayun, please. Professor Vayun Lo. That's why your sounds are not coming. Uh, yes. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Right. Okay, our next panelist is Professor Dato, Dr. Awam Bugiba, Awang Mahmoud. Uh, Professor Dato, Dr. Awam Bugiba is actually the president of APAC Kuala Lumpur branch, an APAC Malaysian chapter. Uh, Professor Awang is also the secretary general for the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. But most important of all in this web banner, Professor Awang is heading the National Task Force on COVID. And he, together with his very capable and high caliber scientists, epidemiologists, clinicians, and researchers, are actually advising the Malaysian government on the analysis and strategies to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Professor Awang, uh, could you sort of give us a snapshot of Malaysian national response uh, in dealing with this uh, COVID-19 and how far more do we have to go? We are right now in this phase four, which is going to end middle of May. So what happens after that? Could you please enlighten on, on, on that? Professor Awang, over to okay. you. Uh, I don't want to preempt government uh, announcements. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Um, I don't want to preempt government announcements, but uh, but we are already now in the phase four of the movement control order, what we call the movement control order, which is basically a lockdown. Uh, it's not as severe as uh, China's lockdown, but nevertheless, uh, travel restrictions are in place. And uh, they, it has had some effect since it was introduced on the 18th of March. Now, when, when the movement control order was introduced on the 18th of March, th there were a lot of cases at that time. And... Uh, I think the Ministry of Health had uh, quite a bit of difficulty in trying to, to contain those cases and trying to test uh, the number of uh, patients which were, were being quarantined and under surveillance. But uh, there has been a concerted effort by academics, uh, people like us and, and all that, who are in charge of labs outside the Ministry of Health system to contribute to this effort. So this has contributed uh, quite greatly to the number of tests that have been uh, been uh, being done now, and I think there's probably no 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 backlog of tests which are, uh, are pending in in Malaysia, and uh, so the subsequent weeks uh, when the movement control order was was first instituted, there was there were still quite hundreds of uh, cases. I think there was at one point there was about two hundred per day and so on. It's it about a peak, but it has come down to to double digit figures now, and uh, that's a very encouraging um, uh, development. My, my team has analyzed the epidemic curve and come to the conclusion that the, the effective reproduction rate has probably come down to slightly less than one now. So we think the epidemic is being brought under control. The only problem now is that how do we come out of this lockdown? And uh, there have been a lot of efforts, of course, uh, pushed by businesses to restart and the economic sector to restart because people's livelihoods are are being threatened and, and businesses are losing money because of the, of, of the lockdown. However, um, uh, we advise the government that yes, you can ease restrictions, 
but you'll have to do this in, in a gradual manner. And following this, this uh, kind of uh, easing of restrictions, I think uh, we have seen uh, cases where uh, certain areas are now being, being targeted as, uh, as greener zones, meaning they don't have, have had no cases for the past uh, 14 days or 28 days, and the restrictions are slowly being eased. And there's uh, increased targeted testing among certain uh, populations which have been found to have high numbers of uh, positive cases. And this includes uh, migrant population, for example. Um, but uh, generally, the, the lockdown has had an effect. It seems to be working. But uh, as always, epidemiologists like to caution the government against uh, complacency and trying to lift the uh, restrictions too soon. Uh, notwithstanding the pressure from uh, businesses and so on, because of the prospect of a rebound, a resurgence in the number of cases. And we are always afraid of that. And we are always afraid that the, the, the number of tests among vulnerable populations are not at the level that we would like to, to be. And we are afraid that there may be seeding among these cases. And when they return to work, and we have a very large pool of migrant workers, as you can see, so when they return to work, we, we may see a resurgence of cases. So in the coming weeks, I, I predict that there will probably be some easing of uh, restrictions in the government, but I don't think it will be a total, totally lifted until perhaps uh, the end of the uh, month. Right, uh, thank you, Professor Awang. Uh, of late in Malaysia, uh, we have this issue with the marginalized uh, community. Right. Uh, migrant workers and refugees. Uh, how do you think you know we could empower this community in terms of uh, adhering strictly to our MCO, the movement, uh, um, the movement control order, or the, and uh, social distancing? Could could you enlighten us on that, please? Yeah, uh, migrant workers officially form about uh, ten percent of the population. There are about three million migrant workers in Malaysia, but the real number is probably double that. So we'll probably have another. 3 million undocumented migrants, uh, migrant workers in Malaysia. That makes it about 6 million. So th that's a very large proportion of the population. And the, and the problem that was, was seen by, by my task force was that migrant workers, to reach out to them, you could not use official channels, nor could you use the official language or use the TV broadcasts in which we normally get messages from and, and even through the, through the phones. So we have advised the government to use uh, unorthodox uh, measures to reach out to them and to, through their own language with an understanding of the cultures uh, involved and the, in the backgrounds of the migrant workers. Because we do know that, that there, there may be a different uh, understanding of what the movement control or the constitutes for them uh, as for, for the rest of us. At the moment, the migrant uh, worker cluster uh, it's about 11% of the total infection. It's about uh, almost 700 uh, cases. But we, we suspect that it may be more than that. It's just that they have not come out because uh, they have not returned to work because of the movement control order. So that, that is the concern that, that, that there be seeding of infections if they are not uh, tested and not isolated and treated uh, before the movement control order is, is lifted. That's, all, that's why my task force has recommended that that special attention be paid to not only migrant workers, of course, but other vulnerable populations, the homeless, for example, the, the elderly in, in care homes and, and so on. The homeless, I think the government has taken some steps in moving them off the streets into temporary uh, shelters and make sure that they are provided for in terms of food and the basic necessities of life. But, uh, and so far, the homeless has not formed a significant uh, source of infection, but uh, we fear that uh, because uh, once the movement control order is uh, lifted and they, they go back to being uh, homeless and so on, that, that they may uh, in future pose, pose a problem. Right, excellent. Now, taking some questions from uh, the floor, um, the question pertaining to our indigenous population, uh, right. the one Asli. So how do we deal with this group of uh, you know, population out there in Malaysia? Okay, the Orang Asli has, uh, has a department which is uh, solely dedicated to the welfare of the Orang Asli in Malaysia. Uh, they call it the Orang Asli or the original people. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a Malay word for uh, the origins in, in Malaysia. However, uh, because of the, 
remoteness of the locations of the orang asli villages. Some of them, uh, you, you can't reach them through any other means except through four-wheel drives and you have to get through jungle tracks to, to reach them. There may be a problem trying to, to reach them. Nevertheless, uh, we believe that there are NGOs which are uh, dedicated to helping these orang asli. And uh, the recommendation by my task force is to use these uh, NGOs to reach them rather than just the official channels. Because official channels tend to be tied up with doing other things too. And other than those which are closer to the to the towns, for example, it's, it's not so easy to reach uh, many of these uh, Aboriginal people. Great. So basically, you know, what you're suggesting is that the government shouldn't be working alone. Uh, so therefore, you know, other NGOs, you know, whether it's formal or informal channel in dealing with, you know, uh, other communities have to come in uh, to play a role, right? Okay, yes. thank you very much, Professor Wang. Thank you. You're welcome. Over thank to you, you Inika. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Wayun. Now we'll be moving to Singapore. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Yor Yik King, known as YY among the friends. Uh, he's the Dean of the School of Public Health, National University of Singapore. Uh, Professor YY has a background in mathematics and uh, trained in Oxford for his PhD and then statistics. And uh, uh, there are diverse range of expertise in him. Uh, currently, he's interested in statistical genetics and uh, he leads the genomics program in collaboration with the Wellcome Trust. In addition, in Singapore, he has the very important position of the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Epidemiology and Research. Or to YY. Thanks, Indika. Thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers for having me. Um, I thought I would just start off with the, what is the current situation in Singapore at the moment. So Singapore, we were one of the first few countries to be affected by the coronavirus in the middle of January. Our first wave were essentially seeded by travelers coming in from China and then infecting people within the community. And that was what started the first wave. We, the country were able to contain the first wave quite well based on some of the measures that I will talk about in, the, in a moment. But right now, Singapore is facing the second wave of transmission in the community. And the second wave of transmission was, was actually attributed very similarly to what Professor Malik has shared earlier on, that there were travellers coming back to Singapore and these travellers were mainly Singaporeans who were in countries in Europe and in North America, and because of the situation in those regions, they were coming back to Singapore. And a fraction of them came back infected, and now that we know asymptomatic uh, infection can happen, pre-symptomatic transmission can happen, this will what seeded the next, the second wave of transmission in the community. Right now in Singapore, we have uh, two fronts that we are managing at the moment. The first front is actually what's happening in the community in public. And the second front is what's happening amongst migrant workers in Singapore. I think Professor Awang, when he was sharing his thoughts in Malaysia, he touched upon some of the, the weak links in a community, and that includes people in the nursing home, care homes, orphanages, but it equally in includes migrant workers living in dormitories. And in Singapore, because the migrant workers actually stay within purpose-built dormitories, some of this, the density of human pop of residents in these dormitories are quite high. So that is an environment that it promotes the spread of a very infectious agent such as SARS-CoV-2. I mentioned that we have about 15,000 infected cases at the moment, but the vast majority of them were from migrant workers in Singapore. In the community, we actually have seen a three-day average drop from 48 about three weeks ago to 13 in the last three days. So in the community, the cases are actually coming down very uh, quickly based on some of the measures that Singapore has taken. In terms of the active transmission, we currently have about 1,700 active cases that are managed in the hospital, of which 22 remains in the intensive care units. To date, since the beginning of the epidemic in January in Singapore, we have seen an unfortunate number of 14 deaths in Singapore. The vast majority of these 14 were coming from elderly people above the age of 60. 
So that gives a sense of the outbreak in, in Singapore. Earlier on, I talked about the measures that we took to contain the first wave. And to a large extent, the measures haven't changed. We still work on three key principles in Singapore. The first key principle is really case finding, performing the necessary test judiciously, contact tracing, and isolating and quarantining. These are the, the principles that we have heard very much reflected in Sri Lanka, in Hong Kong, in Malaysia. So the measures that have done very successfully to keep numbers down in Sri Lanka right now, I understand you only have 694. Fantastic job there. Those measures that you have put in place around case finding, around contact tracing, around isolation and quarantine, that has to remain and that remains right now as one of the key principles in Singapore's fight against COVID. The second is actually taking a, a very much a data and evidence-based approach. And this is where the use of models to understand how will the spread look like, the reliance on information around serology, understanding what is the serial prevalence in the country, how, what is the fraction of people that remain susceptible to, to the infection, such principles remain very vital in the country's fight against COVID. So taking an evidence-based approach in the design of policies. And the third is really around the communication strategies. And we have, we have heard very well from uh, it, the examples in Sri Lanka that communications, clear communications to the public remains vital in these times because it allows the, the people in public to know what is the situation in, in the country what are the measures that individuals like you and me can take in terms of personal hygiene, in terms of mask wearing? The third is in terms of new regulations that are coming on board. Regulations change with time because countries need to evolve their measures, whether to tighten or to ease certain measures uh, in public to, uh, to manage the situation as, as it continues. The third point that I wanted to make, it's, it's actually around clinical management. So, in Singapore, because of the, the high number of cases that we see, the vast majority of them comes from the migrant workers. Many of them are actually pretty young and they suffer from mild symptoms, mild versions of the infection. We actually adopt a strategy that we have community isolation facilities to look after the mild cases with very strict observation of whether there are signs that some of these people may be uh, progressing to a more severe stage, and these are moved very quickly to the hospital. Then people who are at higher risk in terms of whether they are older or they already exhibit certain complication symptoms, those are the ones that are managed in the hospitals. This way, it, it allows us to actually preserve our vital resources such as intensive care units, such as ventilators for the people that requires, the patients that require it most. And then the last point I wanted to touch on is very much what Professor Malik has mentioned as well. What are the next steps? Right now, Singapore is in a phase which we call circuit breaker. It is considered a partial lockdown. We have put in place school closures. Non-essential workspaces have actually been closed as well. So only the essential services still remain. This will go on until the 1st of June. We believe based on the data that we have seen so far that it is very likely that some of these measures will be eased uh, on the 1st of June, including allowing perhaps students to go back to school. So those are the measures that we think will be. But I share the same concerns around complete lifting of measures to allow life to resume pre-COVID. We don't think that will happen. There will be certain degrees of uh, safe distancing or social distancing that will still remain very much in your, uh, your social space, such as your, your shopping malls, your restaurants. We believe that perhaps the norm that will happen even after lifting or easing of this lockdown will be uh, dining options and takeaway options, sorry, takeaway and delivery options. Dining in is unlikely to happen in my opinion, uh, uh, but there will be a very judicious evaluation of what can be unlocked, what can be eased, and what must still remain in place, such as mask wearing, such as safe distancing measures, and such as good personal hygiene that will help to eliminate, uh, to minimize the risk of transmission between people. 
My final message is really people remain at the heart of this. The communication has to be very clear to the public that if there is no need to be out in public spaces, they should really minimize being outside. And that has been very much the core of what Singapore has been putting in place over the past six weeks. Back to you, Indika. Thank you, Vaivai. So you seem to be resonating with the same opinion of others that we need to learn to live with Corona and the measures of restrictions are unlikely to go away in the very near future. And when Singapore says dining in is not an option, I think we have to take it. Uh, if I can ask a question from your expertise, what do you think about the role of statistical mathematical modeling related to the prediction or it planning, say how many bits we need and what are the facilities and how we can either relax measures or tighten measures? Can you explain or elaborate on that? So thanks very much, Indika, for the question. I, I actually see this role of statistics or even mathematical modeling to come into uh, a few areas that are very important. The first is to help us understand what is the dynamics of transmission for the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. What does that mean? It means that do we know that when one person is infected, what is the likely number that if he or she will go on to infect? And that is known as the reproductive number, the infectivity rate. So we know that in the absence of any measures, one person on average in, in the, the cosmopolitan setting that we have in cities these days, one person is likely to infect another two or three more person. That actually means that this coronavirus is quite an infectious agent because in two days, or uh, in about four days, we're now looking at potentially a doubling or tripling of the numbers. And every four days, we are doubling and tripling the numbers. So that it allows us to use numbers to understand how the infection is likely to take off in a region or in a country. So understanding that allows us to also make sure the measures that we put in place, are we able to minimize this spread now? Are we able to shift this one person infecting two others perhaps one person infecting lesser number of people, perhaps less than one. That is the first use of mathematical models. The second use of mathematical models is actually more to understand resource planning as well, because we know that as the infection continues, we are looking at potentially 12, 18 months more of COVID. We need to know how many ICU beds, how many face masks, how many ventilators, how many gowns that will be required. On a day-to-day -day basis, what is the utilization, the burn rate that the healthcare workers are using? How much does a country need to prepare in advance to make sure that the country has the necessary amount of PPE to protect the healthcare workers? And you could take this forward in many ways because it's equally relevant when we start to think about food security issues for many countries. One of the aspects that I've been reading uh, very clearly that from the comments is that food security is becoming a very big problem with all this lockdown. There are segments in the community that are unable to have the necessary food security, the necessary supply of food. Countries, governments need to have also a sense of how to estimate or model the need for food just as much as for vital clinical or medical supplies as well. And I see that mathematical models become absolutely crucial in this setting. So it's not just about understanding the disease, understanding the resources that we need for managing the disease, understanding the, the relevance or effectiveness of some of these lockdown measures. Equally, it is also to understand other non-health aspects that are related to our everyday life and everyday survival, including food, water resources, and so on. Back to you, Indika. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, YY, for that excellent presentation and sharing your expertise. Now we'll be moving to uh, another country that we want to hear from. Prof. Ayun, or to you. Yes. Okay. Moving on to the next uh, panelist, Professor Gordon Liu. Yeah. Uh, Professor Gordon Liu is a uh, Peking University Yangtze River Scholar, Professor of Economics at the Peking University National School of Development. And he's also the director of the Peking University China Center for Health Economics uh, uh, Research. Uh, prior to joining uh, Peking University, Professor Liu 
was associated with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he was also uh, a professor at the University of Southern California. And uh, currently, uh, Professor Liu sits uh, on the China State Council Health Reform Advisory Commission and also in the United Nations Sustainable Development and Solution Network. Professor Gordon Liu, China has come a long way and it has gone through trials and tribulations in getting where you are today. Now, what are the lessons that other parts of the world or Asian countries who are still grappling with this uh, disease? What can we learn from it? Thank you, Professor Lau and uh, our host for inviting me to share some of my observations in China with you. Uh, what we can learn from uh, what China has done in the past couple of months in um, fighting against the virus uh, would be as follows. One, uh, one point I want to share with you is um, since January 23rd, when China uh, decided to uh, lock down uh, Wuhan city where um, the virus was originated. Uh, and then the most other, uh, all, all other cities uh, also followed their restricted um, uh, regulations uh, yeah, accordingly. Uh, this is be primarily because China has a very strong central government leadership and all the local governments would have to unconditionally follow, okay? So as a result, uh, China uh, has done a great job in terms of uh, the control of the virus within um, uh, uh, two months. Um, and of course, we cannot attribute uh, the final outcomes only to the government intervention uh, because there might be some other factors in the equation which we don't know yet. For example, uh, maybe this is the first wave of, uh, of the attack. Maybe we are subject to somewhat different type of the virus. We don't know yet. But I would say the government, the strong government leadership to, um, to have a national uh, uh, universal um, actions. I think that's, that's one lesson uh, one can uh, uh, take it. Uh, I'm not saying other countries should or would be able to follow that, okay? Uh, another lesson that, that we have noticed uh, was um, during this uh, uh, shutdown or lockdown period, many hospital facilities um, were almost fully uh, stopped for uh, all other diseases, um, diseases except um, um, uh, patients coming to the hospital to seek care uh, related to the, um, uh, uh, the virus. Therefore, many patients with other conditions uh, uh, ha had to delay their care uh, for days, if not weeks or months, which we know would uh, have the consequences uh, which uh, should, should have been assessed or watched in the a, in a, in a coming month. We, 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 I, I think we can, um, we can see how the data would change in, in the, um, in the, in the um, mobility or mortality uh, um, cases due to other diseases. And um, the other, the other um, factor I would, I would consider for such a great success in China temper for now is because China is huge. Uh, when, when one province had, had the problem, all, all other provinces and cities can be united together under the central government uh, leadership to support that particular city. Uh, which again, I think it's very hard for other countries to learn because we have a, such a huge country, okay? Now, a couple of other points I wanna share with you. Uh, I think it's good um, for um, other, 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 other countries to, um, to um, consider. You know, one issue is um, uh, the, the inequality issue. Um, 
my 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 concern is in 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 a country where um you know um the the virus is not an equal opportunity killer uh, in other words um pe people with different social economic status may be subject to quite different risk okay for example in the data uh, which is quite comprehensive in the US where they can document the social economic status by race you know by education we see clearly that african americans uh, actually have much higher risks to be affected to be hospitalized to um, and, and and to have died compared to whites asia and uh, that the Americans, okay? So, um, because the data in other countries, like in, in China, we don't have s specific information about those individual characteristics. We cannot uh, um, quite um, uh, be sure what would be the inequ uh, inequity issue here um, in, in my country and in other countries. But I, but I think uh, the studies done in the US because of their good quality data should provide us some important insights that we really should pay attention to the inequality issue because that's a fact, that's a reality. So that's, that's one point I wanna share with you. The other point I wanna share with you is, um, is, is um, um, w w what we can really do next in terms of the actions a country can take because we know for this first wave, um, we already have taken whatever action we, the way we have taken. But in the future waves, uh, uh, I think we should be more careful because we have, we have more time to think about, we have, uh, we have uh, more information. Now, basically I think we, we, we can categorize the, the national actions into three big categories, right? In, in, my, in, my, in my view. The first category is what I would call the moderate action, which basically uh, is the action that would be based on symptoms um, to conduct a test, for example, temperature. In China, that's what we, we did. You know, we, we, whenever we go anywhere, you know, pe uh, uh, we will be taking a, um, a, a simple test of um, uh, temperature to see if you have a symptom. If you cough, you have a high, uh, you have a fever, then you will be um, taken to to the, the, the clinic to to conduct a test. And then if you're found to be positive for the virus, then you will be either sent to the hospital or you will be quarantined at home or in the communities. Okay, that action is um, is uh, is is taken by many countries, but but we know that actions has pros and cons. Uh, the, the, the type one error that, that, uh, um, that is a failure to let the enemy to go is quite large because you conduct a test only based on symptoms. So if there are so many people with the, with the um, asymptotic condition, you just don't know about it. Um, so, so we should keep that in mind, okay? Now the type, uh, the, other, the other actions, which I would call the surgical action, uh, basically, that refers to shutdown or knockdown. Now, for for that action, of course, we would not commit any type one error to let any enemy to to go away. However, there is a huge type two error. That is, you punished the uh, uh, people who are innocent, and that that mistake would would uh, would involve huge cost with uh, social, economic, and human. And, 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 and human cost as well. Um, now, the third option that, that a country can consider is somewhere uh, in between or more innovative. That is what uh, Paul, uh, economist Paul Rumer called the mass testing. Because when we conduct a mass testing, so you, we can be more productive to find where the hidden elements are because this virus is quite different from SARS, which would uh, allow you to easily track where the enemies are because symptoms are developed very quickly and, uh, and, and they are very serious. But, but this uh, COVID-19 enemies are not. 
So if we can mobilize resources to conduct tests as many as possible, I think that, that, that approach, that option would, in my view, would be way better than any options we can think of. Now I calculate you know, the cost um, actually based on China case. Based on China case in the past um, the three months, my calculation is, uh, is, about, um, is about the two to three percent of GDP in the first quarter, okay? And the IMF uh, estimates is around um, uh, five percent of GDP whole year if we continue uh, 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 what we did. Now, if if I use my uh, my conservative estimate, which is about two to three percent of GDP, that would translate into around five hundred billion U.S. dollars that we 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 have lost because of the of, of the lockdown. Now, if we conduct a, a test for every citizen in, US, uh, in, in China, we, we, if we take 20 US dollars per test, right now that's a market price in China, multiplied by 1.4 billion people, that would be somewhere around $22 billion in, the, in, in China. That's, that's one time test for the whole people. So that is, that is very, very small proportion of, of, the, of, uh, of the $500 billion. Even if we conduct four times or five times a year, that's still a, mu a much better deal uh, to, uh, to have a much higher yield and a, and, uh, at, a, uh, at a much lower cost. Uh, of course, that also depends on your capacity. So that, I think that's something I would really urge every country to consider. If your capacity would allow you to conduct a test, I think we should do that um, because the, you would always gain economically com, uh, to, by, by, by doing a mass test compared to the, uh, uh, the other alternatives as I uh, el uh, uh, elaborate. So I, so, so I think um, this is really something I want to uh, encourage colleagues to think about. Uh, one final thought. That is when we look at um, the the impact and the cause of the COVID-19 for short-term and long-term. We, as a health economist or health policymakers or public health experts, should always take a holistic approach, not just a focus on one particular disease. Because if we compare either case fertility rate or crude mortality rate or, or morbidity, of the whole population. I mean, when I compare the facility, uh, uh, the, the mortality rates or mobility rate of COVID-19 against top 10 diseases that either kill the most Chinese people or cause us to have so much diseases, the COVID-19 is still not in the top seven. So in other words, when we talk about this current um, um, uh, uh, virus enemy, we should always keep in mind that we have many other enemies to deal with in the long run. So that's something we should always keep in mind because these days, whenever we talk about COVID-19, everybody talks about it. And everybody thinks we should allocate the resources to, um, to, to, the, to the battles against COVID-19 as much as possible at any cost, which in my view is not the correct. You know, we really should think about, there, is, there, there are so many other enemies out there that will bother us for a long, long time. Cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, all these killers are, are, are out there and which also can uh, be better managed if we allocate uh, or more resources to it. So, so if we can uh, take such a holistic approach, I think in the long run, we would be in better position. We can be more powerful and productive to fight against this kind of enemy because we can better use the resources that are limited to any society. Right, thank you so much, Professor Gordon Liu. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, now, uh, since you have brought up, you know, the case of the uh, cost effectiveness in terms of doing a mass screening, you know, as compared to selected uh, uh, screening, you know, of the population, uh, I'm just wondering, and since you come from the economics background, how do you actually strike a balance between health, you know, health of the population, 
And as we know that Kuwait has, you know, affected, you know, the economy of any uh, nation. So where is the balance here? Are you taking care of the health of the community or are we looking after the economy of the country? Can I have a very brief response from you, please? Yes. yes. Thank you, first of all, that's, that's, a, that's a fabulous question, uh, which has been hardly debated in, 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 the, in the international communities, particularly among economists. Some economists basically say it is a false um, trade-off between saving life versus uh, saving economy. I think that's, that's, that's not a way to put a, right, a, a trade-off because there is no such a trade-off between saving life and saving economy because saving economy is ultimately to save people because people can die from disease, but people can also die from hunger. Within a week, if you don't eat anything, you die right away. So I will not put that way to, 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 to consider saving economy and saving, saving uh, health uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a two dichotomies. I don't think that that is the right way to do it. I think what we're saying is we all try to save our life, but our trade-off is in between um, the, uh, 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 the options that are available to us in, in, a, in, in terms of the degree of the interventions uh, uh, from, uh, from moderate interventions to very severe intervention. I think that is something we really should um, think about because I think that depends on spe uh, right. country specific conditions. It, yes. uh, I cannot give you a clear cut answer, but again, do not ever believe there is a trade-off between saving life and saving economy. That's a wrong trade-off. Okay, the message is very clear, has Gordon. Uh, in view of the time constraint, we need to move on now. Thank you so much for all your views, Professor Liu. Over to you, Indika. Thank you. So, Professor Vayun, uh, now we, before we move into the, the final speaker, a very important person, Professor Colin Bins, uh, can I ask from the audience here in Sri Lanka about one final message that they want to give as well, just to break the monotony uh, before we move on to Professor Colin Bins. Just a few minutes. Dr. Anand, if you want to very briefly, one sentence, any final message that you want to give, take home message. Without, uh, this is going to, uh, the COVID is going to be with us for maybe for several months or maybe even more than that. So we are going to live with that. Uh, so therefore, since it is a very new thing, since the knowledge the world has is very limited, uh, one thing is it is very important to share this knowledge so that we can handle this uh, uh, better. The second thing is, uh, since we will have to live with this for, for the near, in the near future, I think it is very important to uh, address the non-COVID aspects of health as well. There are much more patients than patients with uh, COVID. So we have to make sure that we take care of those patients also while protecting the healthcare professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Uh, Commander, sir, any take home message that you want to highlight? Uh, yes, <clears throat> it is uh, for COVID-19, I think uh, any success of any strategy, strategy will depend on the people. So educating people is the most uh, thing, people-centric strategy should be there. So I believe that uh, how will they know? So educate people through, uh, as uh, Professor Malik Piris and what we mentioned, is a very good communication. So with very thorough, uh, well-informed communication to the population will uh, depend on the success of uh, any country. So I believe that People should be educated, well informed uh, of the all all the instructions that they want to do, and if people behave, then of course country can win. Thank you, thank you, Commander. Dr. Anil Jasinger, any take home message that yeah. you want to highlight based on maybe based on the presentation that were done before as well? Yeah, actually, especially last presentation was talking about economy and health. Uh, I believe uh, one thing. Uh, the, we have to balance between them uh, in the sense uh, uh, I think we have to go for a gradual, uh, you know, uh, normalization, gradual, uh, not all of a sudden. And uh, 
because we see this country or wherever, uh, when you only uh, concentrate on COVID-19, you tend to, you know, uh, lose the grip on other uh, other diseases, other health problems, as uh, this gentleman said, other enemies. So uh, that's going to be a problem. And uh, our plus point is that while gradual uh, normalization is going on, we can keep on controlling because we have a public health system and we are, we are not only this, we are controlling other diseases and we have uh, come to a, a, a level of control that some diseases are no more uh, public, public health uh, problems. So while the normalization is going on, we must not take our eye away from COVID-19. But not that we, we must only uh, keep the eye on COVID-19. That is going to be a uh, wrong practice. And of course, for that, uh, on, one, on one hand, the health authorities will have uh, certainly primary uh, responsibility. On the other hand, the, 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 the government, the government institutions, private institutions, society will have a major responsibilities. Now, during last few months, uh, we have learned a lot of good habits, right? So now with uh, normalization, if these good habits go away, then we are asking for another wave. So we have to somehow institutionalize and the society must take them. Now, it's, it's not only on, on COVID, uh, any, any respiratory virus for that matter. And uh, so if the, if the population is healthy of any respiratory virus that is that is better, then you will have more productive population. And also, because this is a new disease and because we need to uh, be watchful, of course, we have to uh, have the necessary level of testing capacity in the society in time to come. So we have a geared up testing capacity. As you know, last several days, the, the, the number was uh, over uh, basically over 1,500. Uh, so, and we, we have plans to go further up. So we will uh, have those, uh, those uh, necessary measures in place with, uh, when normalization takes place. And on the other hand, it's not only a health, it is a socioeconomic and also like dengue, all the other sectors, every individual, all institutions, the government, everybody must get involved in this battle but not only this battle you know not only concentrating on this if you if you have a balanced uh, we want this i'm sure we we can uh, we can win the battle thank, thank you, you. so it's all about the community empowerment that's the theme of this conference as well let's move into the our expert panel in the audience as well very briefly uh, we have audience panel that represent a wide range of specialties uh, we can start from this end uh, can you introduce yourself, Mr. Jagat, and very briefly, very briefly, your message, maybe one or two sentences. We, we have questions related to the mental health, behavioral changes, vaccines, different treatment modalities, ICU use, or how many children are infected? Yeah, sounds are not clear. I'm, yes. Uh, I'm Jagat Vikramanayaka, President's Council. Uh, I'm only on the legal matters that I'll be, I'll be dealing with. Uh, that I have been invited for that. Uh, now, the issue that I see here from what I gathered from all the speakers, we need to have certain regulations in place. As we all saw, the law that we have is the, the quarantine and preventive, uh, pre prevention of diseases ordinance, which is more than 100 years old. And I saw there are a couple of amendments, the, which amendment, I think the last amendment had come in in 1953. Now, in 2016, the cabinet had taken a decision to amend the law, but it had not happened. So there is a requirement right now, since we do not have the parliament in place, we are not in a position to bring in new laws. So the only way out is to bring in new regulations under the act to address these issues. Now, if you take for an example, I was just thinking to myself, now, if you want to compel a person to go for a test, we do not have regulations to compel people to go for tests. It's their option. If someone is refusing 
to subject them, that person self uh, for a for a uh, kind of a test, then we will have a problem. So we need to have regulations in place to discipline people. Quite apart from as the as uh, the commander said, it's the responsibility of the people. But from our side, we need to have the laws also in place. Now, if you look at the the punishments for offenses under the act, there are no offenses under the act. All what it says is, if somebody is violating the regulations, the, the you you know you can the person can be taken to court. So then look at the punishment: six months imprisonment or a fine of thousand rupees. So I do not want to go into much detail. But if he's the first time offender, if there is no history of uh, any other offenses, you know, like of that particular person. There is suspended sentence that has to be that has to be imposed. So do those issues are there. We need to have strict and stringent laws without violating the human rights of the people in order to address this issue. I think we need to have the proper regulation. That is what we can do. And the moment the parliament is convened, we need to have new laws as well. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Padma, one sentence or two sentences for your key message. Dr. Padma Gurunathne, President Electra Vishalami. Uh, I all the time tend to uh, feel that whether we adequately emphasize the need for elders to be uh, taken care of them. Uh, so I all the time uh, wish that if uh, all uh, address that and make elders more educated to take care of themselves better. Uh, Dr. Jayan Mendis, there are a lot of questions on mental health, how we can... Uh, uh... Yeah. You see, this my issue is psychosocial. This uh, you may have seen, all of us may have seen this distributing five thousand rupees for people, and it appeared that it had not been happening in a fair way, or or the grammar savers or whoever they had taken the power into their hand, and that itself has. Uh, the people have broken the the rules of this one meter away and various various other kind of issues and i think whatever the capacity or the power what uh, the people have i think that has to be uh, um, uh, looked into number two is that those who are those who have been addicted to drugs and from the college of psychiatrists we have come forward with the Ministry of Health uh, to rehabilitate uh, those who has been consuming drugs and drug and alcohol service needs to be strengthened and that's what we need to we need to do from this COVID-19 yeah. infestation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Prof. Manu Chvira Singh, one message in one sentence maybe. I think one of the key message here is the health system in this country for over 90, 70 or 80 years now is a free health system where the people who are taking care is not to, not to pay anything to the government at that particular moment. I think that has paved way a huge contribution in continuing this effort of COVID-19. If it was based on insurance, and if people had to be paid for most of the things that the government or the military is providing now, then it would have been an extremely difficult situation for the public and for the country to actually control this disease. So that key message has to go on. Thank you. Dr. Swarna Kumar, one quick message. I'm representing uh, Sri Lanka Orthopedic Association. Um, we are batting well in general in uh, Sri Lankan uh, field in COVID. Um, to support this uh, COVID uh, management as a role in general, we are managing only the accident-related uh, surgeries, general surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, everything. but we are not doing any elective surgeries to maintain the resources to support this COVID management to support the health uh, ministry. Okay, uh, thank you. Now uh, we'll be moving to the next half once Professor Colin Bean's presentation is over. Now we are moving into the furthest part, the Australian uh, continent. Professor Colin Bean is one of the top level experts 
in public health and nutrition with our decades of experience and he has been a vice president of APAC as well with over 600 publications to his name and 50 books. I think Professor Colin Wins is one of the distinguished luminaries in public health. Over to you, Professor Colin Wins. Oh, good morning, good afternoon, Indika, Wayun, and everyone. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? Australia is different to many countries in that we are very isolated, but we're dealing with COVID-19, which is the probably the most significant infectious disease epidemic that's hit the world for the past 100 years. And that's because we have no prevention, we have no vaccine, we have no treatment. We know that it's highly contagious and the outcome is pretty bad. In Australia, currently, we've had about 6,700 cases with 83 deaths, but we have tested 517,000 people, which means that we're getting a 1.3% positive rate. This means that we are able to say pretty confidently that we're picking up almost everybody that has the disease. At present time, 70% of cases have been acquired overseas and internal transmission has been very limited because we've implemented a lot of contact tracing and quarantine. We have pretty severe restrictions, but not as severe as some other countries. For example, restaurants and other places of public gathering are closed. Schools are open although a lot of parents seem to be keeping their children at home to, and the government or the school authorities are offering uh, internet teaching. But if you want to go to the beach, just walk up and down or something like that, you're very welcome to. Next one, please. This is the curve of new cases in Australia, and you can see that we have well and truly peaked and uh, at the moment, we're only getting a, a handful of cases. Next one. This is my own state of Western Australia, which is a, a small population of 2.6 million. We're one of the most urbanized countries in the world with 2.14 of those people, 2.14 million of those people all living in the one capital city of Perth. And of course, we're one of the most isolated cities and it's 2,700 kilometres to Adelaide, which is a long way away. In Western Australia, we've had 550 cases. We've had eight deaths, unfortunately, and four of them were from the one uh, cruise ship. Now, what we have done in Australia, and particularly in Western Australia, is to implement very strict quarantine laws. If you arrive at Perth Airport from overseas, you are welcomed. Uh, you're asked about your health. And regardless of what you say, you are sent off for 14 days quarantine in either a luxury hotel or a holiday camp on a nearby island. And you are in strict quarantine during that time. If you should try and sneak out one night to go and visit your girlfriend, well, bad luck. Uh, there are a couple of people who are now in prison uh, because they were charged with breaking uh, the quarantine. So we've been very strict with quarantine. If you fly from Sydney to Perth, if you can actually get a flight, when you arrive in Perth, you have 14 days automatic quarantine. Tracing of all contacts has been very strict. And even in our small, small state, the health department has employed 170 staff in tracing uh, all contacts. They are then either uh, isolated or treated uh, as the need demands. Uh, and this has been highly effective because we've been able to keep all of these numbers down. There's been strong community support for social distancing, keeping one and a half, two metres away from everybody. And although you're allowed to go shopping, uh, there's always a security person at the, at the door of the supermarket to make sure that there are not too many people in the facility at the same time. Next one. I just wanted to, to remind everybody that the 
the usual trend amongst infectious disease epidemics like this is that initially it all seems extremely severe and that's because we only diagnose the peak of the epidemic and we very rarely pick up the mild diseases and the subclinical diseases in the initial stages. So depending on which epidemiologist does the modelling, uh, some have suggested that we're only detecting about 6% of all of the cases. Others have suggested that we might be detecting up to 10% uh, in the world. But whatever it is, the number of cases, particularly mild ones, is much greater than uh, the published figures. In Australia, we can be fairly confident because of the very, very high rates of testing, but I'm not uh, an expert on the other countries. We have seen published in the last few days, for example, the number of deaths that are occurring in the United Kingdom. Uh, the deaths there have doubled. There have been an extra 10,000 deaths per week, which are unexplained. And that will probably turn out to be related to the COVID-19 disease. So it's a real challenge for us. Uh, in Australia, the Prime Minister of the national, the national Government and the Premier of our state have made almost daily appearances on television. In my own state, standing next to the Premier is the Chief Medical Officer, who is a public health graduate from our university and in our country the politicians have listened to and followed the advice of experts. Now there's one question that came up about the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health. Yes we would love to publish papers on coronavirus but traditional journals are very slow because we have to maintain standards, we have to review papers and then we have to go through the processes of editing and typesetting and publication. So it's not a medium for rapid publication. We were trying to get out an, an issue on COVID-19 uh, pretty quickly, but it's been delayed because of the lockdowns that have occurred in Malaysia and in India, where our publisher does lots of work. So I think that we'll probably be using the APAC website as a more rapid means of communicating data. Uh, that's about all I can say about Australia at the present time. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Bins. Uh, can you tell uh, briefly about the impact of COVID on nutrition? Because you are a world expert on nutrition, uh, world <laughs> uh, luminary. Yeah, and well, actually, it's had an interesting impact in, in Australia because restaurants are closed. Uh, a lot of people are staying home and cooking for themselves and generally cooking healthier food. So, so it's probably had a favourable uh, impact from that perspective. Of course, the other aspect of nutrition is that people who are well nourished are able to respond better to infection and so their infections are likely to be less severe and uh, over quicker. So we need to maintain good nutrition. There is no evidence that, of course, that any nutritional intervention is actually going to Im improve the outcome of uh, COVID-19 at this stage. Thank you, Professor Colin. Uh, let's very briefly move into the Sri Lankan audience again for very brief comments from their side. And now we are actually moving towards the latter part, the last few uh, sections of this conference. Can we have again brief comments from uh, this side of our audience, from the experts uh, related to maybe infectious diseases or childhood infections, ICUs, different treatment modalities, if you can have brief comments from you that would be very valuable after that we'll be moving into some of our international speakers and then the concluding remarks uh, professor harendra de silva who's the, who's the you, president Indica. of the medical council uh, uh, thank you Indica. i think i had two messages one is that uh, there are uh, 500 uh, doctors who are qualified uh, they are uh, 
merit lists are okay, except for the uh, ERPM students, we are trying to do that by getting in our staff. And we can actually even give them provisional registration. But at the moment, we have found the transport for the staff. But we had a lot of difficulty yesterday in getting curfew passes. Uh, but I think it may be sorted out now. The second thing is, I think, from a clinical aspect, uh, I think more testing is important. I know we are doing. Uh, I don't think we should rely only on PCR, which is the gold standard, which I agree. But we may have to, because of the facilities available, we may have to get on to the antigen test. But antibodies should be more in terms of epidemiological reasons and mapping out spread of diseases the antibodies will be useful, but not during the acute stage. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Prof. Saroj, very brief comment from your side. Prof. Saroj Jaisinger. Uh, yeah, I think uh, one key issue is uh, the stigma, and uh, which is going to have an effect on community engagement. So the media has a major role to play in reducing stigma and uh, so that it will facilitate community engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Prof. Uh, Dr. B.J.C. Pereira on childhood infections and uh, thank you indika uh, i have got a couple of things to say there are some uh, as uh, far as my profession goes i'm a consultant pediatrician so my primary interests are children uh, there is no reason to believe that children are less liable to contract with the disease they are as liable uh, but of course the positive side is that uh, they don't seem to be that badly affected and even here, I think the number of cases of children, I think, Ananda, I think you might agree, it's generally, at the moment, it's certainly less than about 20. I don't think it's more than that. So uh, that way, I think um, we are on a very good wicket as far as uh, children are concerned. But the one little concern over the last two weeks or maybe over the last week or so, especially in Europe, they have been reporting a very disconcerting complication, which may be, I stress, may be associated with the coronavirus. That is a multi-system inflammatory disorder, which makes children very, very ill. And in England, at least, um, uh, quite a number of children, significant number from that point of view, as far as severity goes, have been affected. Uh, at least 12 have needed um, intensive care and one has needed uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation ECMO. Now we have this, as far as we can say that at the moment, this seems to have been reported from Italy, the United Kingdom, Portugal, and Spain. The Asian countries, we have not seen this yet, but then there is no room for complacency. I think we need to be prepared in case this pro complication, which is thought to be associated with the coronavirus, arrives in our land as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shirani, anything about any key message about infection control? I think we cannot ignore that we, we have to continue social distancing, hand washing and cough etiquette. We have to learn to live with COVID till a low cost vaccine is available. There's no return back to our previous world. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Vajira regarding genetics aspect? I think, um, uh, thank you, Indika. Um, so um, uh, I think one of the themes that came out because this was an international uh, meeting with uh, uh, experts from everywhere talking was uh, the, um, you know, what are the measures to take to uh, ease these uh, current restrictions? And I think the, the key theme that is coming out is that uh, we need to increase uh, testing capacity and make testing widely available and also take testing to the community. And um, I saw also in the uh, chat, lots of people were asking, uh, what is the extreme strategy of different countries? And that is something we didn't uh, kind of discuss yeah. today. But uh, I think uh, as part of that extreme strategy, testing, widespread testing, I I identification, isolation, and especially for taking from Professor Malik Peters' presentation about the fact that uh, lots of people are infected before people actually know uh, that they are uh, carrying the virus is a very important take home message. So therefore, um, we need to all work towards that. And one of the key challenges that Sri Lanka has also encountered in that process is establishing the supply chain 
for all the reagents and consumables involved in testing. So um, we need to um, uh, promote a more international cooperation in that sphere, as well as uh, uh, promote uh, local innovation uh, in the in the field of biotech um, industry. And I think uh, the strength of uh, China, as well as uh, uh, for example, um, South Korea was that they had very strong uh, local biotech industry. So this we should also take it as an opportunity to strengthen our own uh, local capacities. And uh, th those are, I think, key messages that we should promote. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. And uh, a lot of mentions about the exit strategy, but going by what was discussed in today's conference, exit seemed to be a wrong word, maybe coexist. Uh, Dr. Ashoka, one final word related because a lot of questions related to ICU beds, how many ICUs we need, how can we prepare? Dr. Ashoka. Yeah, uh, thank you, Zika. I'm the president of the College of uh, Anesthetists and Intensivists. Uh, we have a plan roughly now, we have uh, about uh, 100, 100 ICU beds if the necessity arises. However, fortunately, uh, the ICU requirement in uh, Sri Lanka had been very, very low. And uh, we had about uh, eight admissions to the ISO at IDH, and we lost about four, and four recovered, and um, two patients died almost uh, on admission or just before, and one at Valikanda. But ever since we have not had, uh, and I don't think currently um, there are any ICU patients. Am I correct, Ananda? Yeah, just one, yes. yeah, just one. So the requirement had been low, but we are prepared. Uh, in addition to that, as Professor Harendra said, we have drawn up a plan to train about 1,500 uh, nurses who are passed out, not yet employed, in critical care, so that uh, if the ministry wants, uh, they can be mobilized. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's move back to our international audience uh, and the international resource persons. Is uh, Prof. Malik Peer still with us? or? Uh, Prof. Awang. Yeah, Prof. Malik Piris, any concluding remark? Yes, thank you so much. Can we start with Professor Malik Piris? Um, no, I mean, I, I don't have any particular concluding remarks, but I think, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, diagnostics, which is my own, own area, right? So we, given the fact that PCR is the most important uh, testing strategy that we have, uh, I talked about trying to decentralize it. And I just want to emphasize that that uh, decentralizing PCR capacity, strengthening your, your provincial hospitals, at least, to be self-sufficient in doing this, is not just useful for COVID. I mean, this is a technology that is useful not just for infectious disease. I mean, it is applicable right across uh, biomedicine. So I think it is, it is an investment that is, uh, that is well worth investing in, uh, uh, certainly even for the long term, uh, even forgetting about COVID. Um, the question of antibody was raised, and I, I want to echo, I think, what uh, Professor Teo said. So we are also uh, using, uh, going to start large-scale population-based zero epidemiology testing uh, to, to understand exactly how widespread this uh, outbreak is. So, uh, for example, you have, you were talking about some localized outbreaks um, in, for example, some slum areas in Colombo, for example, it'll be quite interesting to, to do zero epidemiological studies in that type of population to see, uh, you know, beyond what has been diagnosed, uh, what is the overall attack rate in the population? So I think uh, these are two specific issues. Um, over. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, Malik. Prof. Awang, any message right. from you? Yeah. Yeah. Um... The COVID-19 epidemic has uh, taught us a couple of things. One is that uh, the responsibility for combating such an epidemic uh, does not fall on one ministry or one agency alone. So future pandemic preparations, I think, should take into account and uh, use a whole of community approach in trying to prepare for such events in the future, because this may not be the last pandemic that we'll see in our lifetimes. Thank you. Prof. Colleen? Well, I think it certainly won't be the last epidemic that we'll see, uh, maybe not in my lifetime, but in most of your lifetimes. <laughs> uh, there's bound to be a major influenza epidemic sooner or later, and that will certainly be a major epidemic. 
in terms of testing, we have tried to, in Australia, set up separate uh, centres for testing for COVID-19. The idea being is that we don't have infectious people coming into contact with patients uh, at health centres or community uh, doctor's offices. We want them to keep them away until the test results are known. So if anybody comes to the family practice where I work uh, and they have traveled or they have been in contact with a COVID case or we suspect that they might have it, they are not actually allowed into the clinic. They are sent for testing first. Uh, and I think that's been very helpful in keeping down the spread of the virus and in preserving the trust of other patients to come and continue their treatment for other chronic diseases. Thank you, Dr. Karin. So now we are moving to the conclusion part of this conference. Uh, can I invite Professor Vayun, the president of APEC, for her concluding remarks? Over to you, Prof. Vayun. Right. All things comes to an end. And so on behalf of APEC, I wish to thank all of you, particularly all the panelists who have contributed your time and effort and your knowledge, you know, in delivering all your talking points. Uh, from the Sri Lanka uh, side, Dr. Anil Jasing, uh, Lieutenant General Savindra Silva, uh, Dr. Ananda, uh, Dr. Malik, and from the APEC uh, side, Professor Awang, Professor Colin, Professor Teo, and Professor Gordon Liu, thank you so much, you know, uh, for such an engaging um, uh, presentation. So I think all of us, uh, you know, would have learned something uh, from this uh, uh, web banner. So I thank you for your active uh, involvement and your contribution to the discussion, which are of vital importance in improving the health uh, of the people in this world. So I think what is important that we learn from this is that the understanding and acting upon these challenges call for a massive uh, collaboration and cooperation uh, across the different mu uh, multidisciplinary areas and national boundaries to safeguard uh, our health. Uh, with that, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Sri Lankan uh, Medical Association and their whole IT uh, team for their support. And thanks for ensuring uh, the success uh, of this uh, webinar. Also to my APAC uh, executive board for supporting this international webinar. And thank you, most important of all, thank you to all the listeners uh, in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Fayun. And with that, we come to the end of this very important conference. Again, on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association, I would like to thank all the resource persons, uh, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama, Commander Lieutenant General Shavinda Silva, Dr. Anil Jasinga. You have sacrificed your valuable time, precious time. Every second is very valuable in this situation. And our expert panel in the audience, again, very important. You have all shared your experiences. Our international speakers, uh, Prof. Vayon, Prof. Avang, Prof. Malik Piris, Prof. Colin Bins, Prof. YY, everyone, because we have learned so much, so many valuable things, and we have learned the importance of the community empowerment, community engagement, and the need to maintain the restrictions and that we need to coexist with Corona. And I think as a region, we can. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a great day.